It is our pleasure to welcome the President of the 70th Session of the UN General Assembly, Mr. Morgan Slogitov, to this exclusive interview with OMB News. Mr. President, your tenure is coming to an end and it has been a hectic journey, I know. So how has it been to be the President of this General Assembly? I think what we have experienced this past year uh, in the world in general, but also in the General Assembly of the United Nations, is this strange uh, uh, diplomacy that, on the one hand, we took very, very ambitious, great decisions on working together on sustainable development and climate. We also saw the agreement unfolding on the Iranian uh, nuclear issue, which was an important, peaceful step forward in non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. That's the positive stories. We also uh, had strong decisions on common action, on, on countering the evils of terrorism, which we're seeing much more of this past year. Uh, and uh, we are still faced with uh, an unprecedented number of conflicts and humanitarian catastrophes connected not only to the conflicts, but mostly to the conflicts, but also to already happening climate change in eastern and southern Africa, for instance. So uh, we are very challenged, and much of the discussion uh, in this past year I have presided on uh, have been, one, on the implementation of the great decisions on, on climate and sustainable development, but two, on how to mobilize the necessary resources for the, for the humanitarian relief uh, and of course also hope for and appeal to the Security Council finally to act, to end, to attack the root of, 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 the root of, of causes uh, for the conflicts uh, and in that way containing the number of, of humanitarian catastrophes. One of the issues that you told us is about the refugee crisis which is going to be discussed as also this current uh, general assembly so what are the challenges you think is facing the world and how can we address this refugee and migration issue once and for all of course it is uh, the only uh, real end to these sufferings uh, is to end the conflict uh, be it in Syria, in Yemen, in southern Sudan, in, inside Iraq, uh, other places in Africa. I mean, uh, there are all too many conflicts uh, also connected with the evils of terrorism uh, around the world. But we are faced with 65 million people uprooted from their homes right now. And we have to provide the necessary resources to give them at least a decent uh, uh, stay uh, in, 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 in the places where they are, uh, have been forced to, to go to. Uh, and that is about bringing relief inside the conflict zones, but also supporting much better the neighboring countries to the, to the conflict zones, who, uh, who are taking most of the burden uh, on, 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 on these global issues. And I think what, what hopefully has happened uh, inside the richer countries after what we saw in Europe last autumn is, well, there may be limits to how many refugees they will receive, but if they uh, will avoid that kind of obligation, they have to step much, much more forward in order to help those countries who carry most of the burden already. We discussed issues about conflict around the world, but one of the most uh, lingering crises has to do the, the Syrian crisis, which has taken more than five years and people have been suffering, women, children, and even men. So what has been your take on that? Terrible, terrible humanitarian uh, uh, toll. Uh, two, three hundred thousand lives lost, uh, a, a whole country destroyed. I mean, uh, uh, here the major powers of this world have not stepped forward and lived up to their obligations in the Security Council. It was, a of course, a kind of progress that in last September uh, 
the Security Council finally agreed on a roadmap for peace in Syria, but we need much more action to end the actual fighting, for instance, around Aleppo. We need much more coordination in the efforts against the, the terrorist organizations like ISIS, but also much more action uh, putting pressure on the, the uh, warring parties inside Syria uh, to live up to the, uh, to the, uh, the plan approved by the Security Council. Other issues I may want to also ask you, it has to do with one other innovation, you created it. That is the standard you set for the selection of the new UN Secretary General, the standard of transparency and inclusiveness. Have you assessed what is happening at the Security Council with the straw polls now? Because last week you sort of criticized what they were doing. I think there are a number of issues around the, the Security Council. One is, of course, limiting the use of vetoes. I mean, there are a number of conflicts that have not, could, uh, have not been addressed by the UN uh, sufficiently because of vetoes in the Security Council. But, but there is uh, the broader and longer term issue of, of reform of the Security Council. I very much regret that the, the member states have not been able to come together on, on one model for reform. We know that there is an understanding that the Security Council has to be enlarged and be more representative for the, the uh, 21st century uh, geopolitical situation. Uh, no doubt about that, but, but the questions of permanent members, veto power and so on, uh, has, been uh, has not been moving forward because they've been stalled uh, by the fact not that we are not many who have pushed for it, but the fact that to change the Charter of the United Nations, you need two-thirds of the member states and the ratification of the present permanent five, which is kind of, of catch-22 in every effort. So I think that at least in order to move this question forward, the two-third majority has to be found first. Uh, uh, on a, a, a specific model, of a compromise model of how to enlarge the Security Council. And then it would be possible for this majority to put pressure on some of the permanent five if they don't agree from the beginning. Uh, but, but, but this hasn't happened, unfortunately. So we stalled here. Uh, and, and the third point I would want to make is that with or without Security Council reform, we will only be able to move this world forward on the biggest of issues, on, on climate, on, on sustainability and peace and security, if those countries, those big powerful countries who are the permanent members of the Security Council will work together. We, we need that. We need that understanding by all of them that the existential issues we are facing are common and uh, that should over throw the divisions in, on specific issues and, and, and bring them to act together. I have made that point uh, repeatedly now that I think it's, it's a little uh, ridiculous that the Security Council pretends that these straw polls are secret. I mean, uh, the, they reach the media half an hour after they have been uh, performed in the Security Council anyway. So it, it would be more in line with the transparency we have worked uh, with this past year in the General Assembly if this process was also formally being totally open in the Security Council. But that's up to them to decide. Anyway, we know the outcomes. <laughs> so so uh, I think that what has happened has been game-changing in the way that for the first time in United Nations history, we were able to have a totally transparent presentation of all the candidates uh, knowing about their personalities, their priorities, but also an opportunity in these informal uh, dialogues to have a very substantial discussion about the future challenges of the United Nations. So that was very good, that was very progressive, and I'm sure this, these dialogues and the uh, global town hall meeting we had in this hall mid-July, transmitted to hundreds of millions of people around the world, also contributed to, in, to include the global audience in this discussion and give 
global audience, also the NGOs, but in certainly the member states who are not members of the Security Council, uh, an influence, a voice on who are the person, the moral authority, the diplomat, the politician, the administrator that we want to have to lead this great organization in the next five, ten years. So, uh, and I think, I'm, I'm quite sure that the process we started for the first time has influenced the views of member states, both in the General Assembly and the Security Council about the candidates. Uh, we have to go back again to another question that has to do with the selection of the Security Council, uh, sorry, the Secretary General. I don't know if you have any favorite candidate, and if you think, does the UN really need a Secretary General, or do you think there should be a name, a new name for it? in order to give it a new meaning or a new projection in the international scene? <laughs> I, I, I have not uh, engaged myself in dropping names on this because I have been elected as the neutral uh, mediator here to, to get quite a new process uh, running. Uh, but of course I follow also the straw polls and try to, to figure out how the process we started influence the outcomes of the store force now and uh, the final decision of course and then the other question does the UN really need a secretary general or you think there's any model should be adopted in the somewhere yeah. to head the united nations no i think uh, that that that's not uh, to believe that there could be quite another model but but it could be uh, in this world of urgent need for understanding the community of interest in all the existential issues, it's very important that it is a strong, independent personality with good communication skills, with good diplomatic and political skills. Uh, almost impossible to have inside one single person, but we have to go for it. Let's all move away from the shores of the United Nations and move into Latin America. You are part of the peace initiative or peace agreement that was uh, was stable in Cuba. In Havana meeting in, in June, yes. So what do you see this agreement pretend to the Colombian people and also to the wider region of uh, Latin America? I think it's very, very encouraging for the people of Colombia, but also for the whole region of Latin America that now we can trust, put trust in that we can end the longest violent conflict in this part of the world and give a good example for the rest of the world. And, and I, I mean, it's a very, very difficult negotiated outcome, but it is without any doubt, uh, in my mind, the best possible outcome. And we, I think both the United Nations, the European Union, the uh, neighbors in Latin America very much encourage the uh, people of Colombia to say yes to this uh, final agreement on the uh, referendum on the 2nd of October. During your tenure, Mr. President, you addressed the issue of, uh, even organized, I would say, a, a summit on the drug trafficking issue in the war. What do you think the General Assembly should do in order to address this international issue once and for all? I think that, uh, well, this was a kind of mid-term mid review on the uh, efforts of the United Nations. It also showed us what we knew beforehand, that there are very different views on how to, to cope with the problems of drug, of drug and how to treat the small consumer of, of, of drugs. Uh, but, but there was, and that I... I, I uh, supported very much. There was, I think, an overwhelming wish from those who participated in the discussion, from member states and from NGOs, that we took more into account the obvious scientific evidence we have about what works and what doesn't work in the treatment of, 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 of the drug problem. Uh, and and, and, and I, uh, I hope that what, what will what happen in the next couple of years is that the understanding of the necessary necessity to base on evidence uh, 
uh, based uh, material how to do deal with this problem will s will uh, have stronger support around the world. I mean, you don't solve the problems by starting a war against uh, drug addicts as we see in one of the member states right now. The other issue we also want to discuss is the Middle East crisis, the issue of Israel and Palestine. It has not been easy in that region. The issue of the two, two state, uh, the two state uh, agenda there, is it gone or what do you think should be done to, in order to have at least peace and tranquility in that zone? I think sadly, uh, it, every day, every week, every month, the present situation continues with expansion of illegal settlements on occupied territory uh, and the occupation of Palestinian land. Uh, it becomes more and more difficult to see the uh, only viable solution which the United Nations has asked for again and again these past nearly 50 years. A, a, a two-state solution, uh, a Palestinian state living in peace with Israel in, inside recognized borders, uh, basically the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem, but uh, some possibilities of land swap. That, that is the content of each and every uh, decision in this assembly, in this United Nations. Uh, and, and it's sad to see how little uh, is actually happened in the right direction on the ground. On the Paris uh, climate change uh, agreement, so far so good. And then what advice have you for also the UN member states in order to have a good rectification of the, uh, uh, of the agreement? And also what is your advice to the biggest polluters like United States, China, and other developed countries in order to get going on this climate change agenda? I think we all uh, now understand the urgency that maybe the, the, the figures we knew uh, about climate change, even when we negotiated this outcome, may be too outdated, that things are happening even faster. So we have to act as fast as possible. And I think what brought us to this, the greatest leap forward in understanding the necessity of action on climate change in Paris in December, was the fact that the two main polluters of this world, the United, Nation, uh, the United States and China, uh, took the lead uh, also in the discussion of a global agreement. And that gives hope, and I think what, what's going on in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Hangzhou, China right now, with the G20 meeting is also what we see a Chinese government pushing very hard for the implementation of the whole package of, global, of, uh, uh, of sustainable development goals, including climate. Because China knows, we all know, that this is not only a global problem, it's a very local problem in many countries that you have to stop the uh, coal-related pollution, you have to change your energy systems, you have to change the methods of your production and consumption pattern uh, uh, in order to, for this globe to survive in a harmonious way. The positive things we have done is to put very high on the agenda the existential questions of sustainability and climate, uh, to stop climate change. and. What we are doing now, on also on the 19th of September, in the summit on, on refugees and, and migrants, to put as high as possible on the agenda the obligation of the global community uh, to act to end the suffering of all those uprooted from their homes of conflict and climate change. Mr. President, it was a pleasure having you in this uh, exclusive interview, and we appreciate your time and also Thank the you. energy you gave us during this uh, exclusive interview. Thank you very much and wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you so much.